Okay, before we start today, before we start today, I'm going to tell you I'm going to break two rules, one a university rule and one a personal rule. First rule is you are never supposed to date the tapes because they run semester after semester. And rule number two is I vowed a long time ago to wear a Looney Tunes tie to the university every day until a week went by where something Looney Tunes did not happen. Just one week of non-Looney Tunes. It's about 13, 14 years now. And I've never, I, once in a while I forget, but I've never won another tie. However, today, see how close, how close can you get to me? Can you guys zero in on me? There we go. Today I am wearing an Astros tie. <laughs> you see it? Because, okay, you can come back now. This particular session of the class is, being, is the first time given after the Astros clinched the wild card spot in 2004. Now, many people are going to watch this tape. It'll be over. You'll know what happened, but I don't care. It's one of the greatest comebacks in the history of the world's greatest sport. I think, actually, the Giants coming back to win the pennant in 51, Bobby Thompson hit the home run off Ralph Branca. The Giants win the pennant. But this was magnificent. And magnificence needs to be mentioned. This was wonderful. I can't believe it. So I have broken my rule, and I am not wearing a Looney Tunes tie today, even though, believe me, plenty of Looney Tunes stuff happened this week. OK? So, but I just, in honor of this great comic. All right, sorry if it dates the tape, sorry if it's old news to those of you who are watching on the tape, but here we go. Okay, today we're going to talk about information processing. Okay, no, 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 just come back to me. Information processing theory, and this is a theory that has a very interesting history. Now, we're going to start with a vote. Those of you at home, I want you to vote. Those of you watching it on a tape or on TV, vote in your hearts. Okay, here people have to vote with their hands. It's simple yes or no. Can computers think? Who votes yes? Who votes no? Everybody votes no. Okay, number two. Question number two. You have to vote. It is possible to play chess, the game of chess, at a world championship level to be able to play the grand masters and to play an even game all, and to play them and even beat them to be in the top one one half of a percent of the world's chess players playing unique games with unique strategies against the best chess players in the world and you can do all that and not be able to think you're a brilliant chess player and you can't think who votes that that's possible who votes that it's not well, those of you who voted that it's not had better make up your minds because they're computers that can play brilliant chess. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, a computer beat a world chess champion. So you had better make up your minds. Now, those of you who voted uh, no, how do you figure? How can you possibly be able to play chess and not be able to think? Half of you voted yes. How can you do? Go ahead. Push it down. We made the computer to think using the process. I didn't ask how the computer got to think. I asked whether it can think. You just said you made it think. That means it can think. How can you play chess and not be able to think? It's the world's most difficult game, probably with you can, bridge. You give the computer a list of all the possibilities and different outcomes to do, and it just goes through its algorithm until it starts I to don't. Move. Now, he's half right. Computers do not play chess the way people play chess. However, championship games are unique. You have to, I mean, they're, it's, they're unique. So would you say, but let's take your example and let's say you're right. Would you say, how many people would say that taking into account 
all the data and information you have, looking at the various possibilities, and then making a rational decision is an aspect of thinking. It's taking in information, thinking it over, and then making a rational decision about it, which turns out to be a correct decision. Is that an aspect of thinking? Who votes yes? Well, you voted yes. That's what you just said a computer did. That's not exactly right, but you've got to make up your mind. Computers can do that. We all know that. Computers can take in information, come up with decisions. Don't worry, pretty soon I'm going to ask if computers are alive. That's going to be a tough one. So maybe computers can think. So today, no, matter of fact, we even have a word for that, artificial intelligence. Okay, I know you, I want you to take a minute to think this over because I know I'm really bugging a lot of you because I don't have too much respect for computers either when it comes to that. But we had a question from last week that I promised to answer at the beginning and I didn't. Go ahead. Uh -huh. in classroom setting. I'm just curious as to how, if we're in a classroom and we're trying to teach 30 kids, how can we keep devoting such individualized attention into such a generalized atmosphere? Okay. Well, here's my answer to that. I'm not going to answer the question now. Okay. Because this is, this is a question we're going to answer at the end. But my offhand answer is, you're right. It's a good question. But let me ask the question a different way, right? Let me say it a different way, right? How can you take a learning setting that violates the principles of every psychological theory that we know? Everyone is going to do the same thing at the same pace, be on the same page, and take the same standardized test on the same day. There's not one psychological theory that would approve of that. And say, okay, now tell me how I can use psychology to help me do something that every psychological theory says is a terrible idea. So you've gotten onto one quote unquote truth of this course that our school, standard schools, really violate principles of learning in psychology. And I told you before at the beginning, if you assume that the purpose of schools is to sort kids out, it makes sense. But if you assume this, what they do, if you assume the purpose of schools is to educate kids, it doesn't particularly make sense. But there are people in this classroom who have been teachers for a long time taking this class. And I know darn well what you do with the rules. You go like this whenever you can, right? When they get a silly rule, right? So I guess what I'm asking is I'm just hoping to give you some sort of a perspective, right, on what's going on and maybe help you within the context of an individual classroom and will help kids, you know, help you understand things. Wait until we get to Piaget's theory, which says, if you take this kid who can't add and try to teach the kid to add, you'll do irreparable permanent damage. If the kid doesn't understand, we'll know. So we just wait. But we'll get there. But it's a very, very good question. Of course, obviously, you can understand that I, my, my hope is that schools can change and that teachers within the context of their classroom will try to be as individual as they can possibly be. But I know it's not the world's best answer. Okay. Because that's the question that really overlies this whole thing. Do I listen to psychology? Do I listen to research? Do I listen to what people tell me? Or I just go forward with my agenda, with my political agenda, with my, with my organizational agenda, and the heck with everything else. I mean, for those of you who want to be counselors, it's even worse if you want to be a school counselor. If you're going to be a counselor in a school, and there's a problem with a kid interacting with a teacher, if you have 50 of those, sometimes the teacher's wrong. Or sometimes it's a clash where both sides have to change. Are schools ready to listen to that? Or is the job of the counselor to make the kid do what the teacher wants? If that's it, that's not a very good counseling practice. 
You never get people in do marriage therapy and say, okay, you're right, you're wrong. You have to do what she says or you have to do what he says. It doesn't work that way. So these things need to be thought through. And I, I guess part of what I want to do here is to say, I just want to give you a different perspective. And those of you who in your gut had a feeling something's wrong here to give you some intellectual ground to stand on. And hopefully, you know, I'm not a curriculum instruction guy. Those of you who are much better at it than I am, and there are most people think this course about better classroom teachers than I am, even though I did it a long time ago, and I did all right, is uh, to find ways to use these theories to help kids as individuals. Okay, now, you have to ask that question after every theory. Okay? <laughs> now, let's talk about information processing here, or about um, the computer. What's bugging people when I say a computer can think? We already had one objection. It doesn't think like people. Go ahead. Actually, we had two objections. Go ahead. It feels like computers have been programmed by a human being and, and something that we condense down to calling thinking is not really thinking. It's a set of if this, then this, and if that, then that. Okay. All right. Well, I have two things to say. Number one, you're right. A person taught the computer, just like a person teaches. If I say, well, I programmed a computer to play chess, good. Well, somebody taught a person how to play chess. Well, you read a book about chess. Well, I can put verbal instructions into a computer. So what I do on the keyboard, right? The second thing I have to say, though, is what do you mean by condensed down? What's bothering you here? A larger scope, okay. Just, it's, it's not what scope it's is missing? All right. What's missing? What's missing from a computer that you would say characterizes human thinking? Reasoning. Go ahead. Thinking out of the box, like it has a certain, you know, what okay. he said earlier, algorithm that it okay. has to follow. Thinking out of the box. We have a, we have a fancy word for that: creativity. Computers are not creative. Go ahead. Uh, the computer can't make new decisions. New decisions, right. Very, here, okay. When you, okay, come, come to the, uh, yeah, this thing. You can feed a computer all this 10 assumptions or 11 assumptions that you make on, oh, this is really bad, that you make when it comes to, pretend this is an isosceles triangle, okay? I can't draw very well. These sides are equal, okay? You can feed a computer a, see if you get my picture in the side there, in the box there. You can feed a computer all the rules of logic and all of the, something wrong? We're getting blinking here. You can feed a computer all the rules of logic and tell it all the, the algorithms and it cannot prove that when you have when on a, when an iso when in a isosceles triangle that when the sides are equal so are the angles, because in order to do that it doesn't get very far. It gets with a few things and it's done. Because in order to do that you have to draw a parallel line up here, right? A line parallel to the base. This is supposed to be parallel to this, and then you can make the proof. Don't ask me how to do it. So in other words, come back to me. You need to be creative. The computer could never prove the Pythagorean theorem because all the proofs that there are requires drawing things in. I think the first proof required making each side a, a square, and then there are all different kinds of proofs. President Garfield made a proof. Yeah, he got assassinated for his troubles, right? No, that's not why he was assassinated, right? All kind, I think that was the last original proof. Garfield did. All kind, but you have to draw something so computers are not creative. They can't think outside the box. We already had someone who said they think differently. They don't think the way we do. So, but they can, but they have an intelligence. They can do some of the things. Here, let's try this. Let's get a name. Uh, tell me your name. Push it down here. Push it down, push it down, push it down. You don't want to answer my question? Brandon, Brandon I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Brandon, okay. Brandon, no taxes involved. John worked eight days 
eight hour, five hours and earn eight dollars an hour. Okay. Then he gave five dollars away to his cousin. After he gave the money away to his cousin, how much money did he have left? Thirty-five dollars. Okay, Brandon got that right. Now, if I would, I can take a computer. Their computers, I can feed in the same information. Bang! Out comes thirty-five dollars. Oh, I say, maybe this computer is a model for Brandon's thinking. I put the information into Brandon. He gives me the answer. I put the information into the computer. It gives me the answer. Now, the truth is, information processing theory, there are certain things about the history of EFU, you know. Number one, it's a, it's an attempt to deal with one of Skinner's objections. Oh, what do you mean? I can't see inside people's heads. I can't measure thoughts and feelings fully. So forget about them. A ridiculous objection can't see gravity either. That doesn't mean that gravity, that gravity, we throw away gravity. I just report things for all done. So obviously I cannot lift off the top of Brandon's head and see how it's working. See what he's doing, although people are trying to get there. But I can lift off the top of the computer, tell how I program, so maybe the computer is a model. Now, if you tell information people, processing people, uh, this is on television, so I have to say this, that information processing, in fact, uses computers as a model, they'll come in, they'll take this computer, whatever computer I have happening in front of me, and they'll beat me over the head with it till I'm unconscious. No, 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 we've gone beyond that. But I don't buy it. I don't buy it. And indeed, you will notice that information processing vocabulary, which is vocabulary about computers, has overwhelmed our educational system. Nobody says anymore, I don't understand. They say, I can't process that information. The kid didn't process the information. I was working with that child. I tried to give her examples, and she didn't process the information. Not she didn't get it. Well, people don't process information. Machines do. We don't learn things anymore. The kid encodes the material. We don't remember things anymore. We retrieve the material from our long-term memory. All of this is computer model. And the truth is the children are treated as little computers in the school often. And you'll notice that this theory is the only one that that doesn't mention emotions in any way. Even by happenstance. Skinner, of course, doesn't mention emotions. Emotions, fully, you can't see them. But in fact, Skinner has an opinion about that. Kids should never fail. He wants error-free learning. Okay? But with a possible exception of Skinner, the more modern theories, this theory, this theory, is, is simply based upon the idea, okay, that it's, right, that, that kids are processing units for information. And it's based upon the idea that the key is memory. Now, this is a course on development. This is clearly not a developmental theory. But I'm putting it in here because it is so overwhelmed. It is so overwhelmed education that's number one, and because it's a perfect juxtaposition, the opposite to the next theory we'll discuss, which is Piaget's theory, that treats pe children and people as living human beings, not as machines. And I must tell you, that is what got me onto the idea of being Piaget. All the theories we've had so far, well, with the possible exception of Bandura. Bandura's theory was much more mechanistic when he started, but it's machines. For, for Skinner, the theory is like, oh, we're a tape recorder, a video tape recorder. The stuff comes in, you push the button, out it comes. Information processing is going to treat people like computers. Now, they've gone on a little. I agree with what they say. But basically, it's a model of memory. And for them, intelligence knowing equals memory. And just as an idea, so you are what you have memorized and what you're able to recall from your memory. Okay? That's how information processing looks at it. And you're a collection of these organizations of memories, of memory abilities. Now, just to give you a little hint with one of my objections, 
Is it possible to know something that no one's ever taught you? Who's, who's here? We have two people from Rochester, the Rochester area, right? One, two of you? you you're not in this game. You shut up. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of Arondequoit, New York? Aside from the two of you. No? Nobody. Okay, come back to me. I'm going to sing. Hail, hail, Arondequoit, our alma mater dear. We praise thee for thy nobleness, thy honor we revere. I went to Arondequoit High. I have bad news for you. I know both verses. And the, No, I'm just kidding. That's enough. Has anybody ever heard of Chile, New York? Here, come to the, 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 the tablet. Here it is. Not Chile. Chai Lai. This is the beach where we went swimming when we were kids. Not Charlotte, Charlotte. Chai Lai. Has anybody ever heard of Chai Lai, New York? Nobody, the two of you here, except the two of them. Okay. So come back to me. Now you can play this game. Okay? No, you've never heard of Ronda Quentin Chai Lai. Okay? Chai Lai is very important because it's where the county airport is to get the heck out of there, right? So, <laughs> all right. Now, here's the question Is it possible? To know the exact... Has anybody ever been to a Ronda Quarter Child, aside from the, my two uh, countrymen over there? Okay. No, nobody. Is it possible to know the exact distance from a Ronda Quite to Chai Lai? The exact distance from a Ronda Quite to Chai Lai. Here's here. Okay. Here's a Ronda Quite. Here's Chai Lai. Okay, come to me. To know the exact distance from Arondequoit to Chai Lai, okay, come back to me, without anyone ever telling you, you can't go there. You've never been there except, uh, you cannot go there. You cannot read it anywhere. No maps. Can't go to measure the distance you got as the crow flies. You can't read it in a book. Can't get on the internet. Can't hear it on TV or on radio. Okay? No one will ever tell you how far it is from Arondequoit to Chai Lai, straight line distance, assuming, okay, straight line, is it? And yet you'll know. We're taking a vote now. Who thinks that it is possible? Not an estimate, not a guess. You'll know exactly. Who thinks it's possible? Tell me how. No, 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 no. Come here, whisper in my ear. I don't want you to, I don't want to give it away. Come here and whisper it in my ear. Go ahead. It's probable that you can see one from the other. Oh, he said you probably can see one from the other. You can't go there, though. You're not, I'm not letting you go there. You can't go there. Because it's across the falls or something like that. No, no, no. You can't go there. You can't read it. And you'll know the exact distance from around the court to Chai Lai. Is that possible? Okay. The two of them probably don't know either. Okay. Okay. Who says it's, you have to vote, people on camera? Who says it's possible? Who says it's not? Raise your hand. Got to vote. You don't stop turning around. How do you vote, yes or no? I know what you just said. You will know the exact distance from Arondequoi to Chai Lai, and no one will ever tell you. You can't read it. You can't see it on TV. No maps. Can't go there. Okay. No, she says no. Okay. Now. Wait a minute. No, no. You can't go. You no, know, nothing. No one is going to tell you. Okay, who's ready to put your money where your mouth is, where your hand is? I'll give you, I'll give you uh, 10 to 1 odds. $100 against $10. Boy, that ought to be enough for a good trip to Vegas. Ready? Okay, let's go back to the, ta to the table here. Okay, let's go back to the... The distance from Chai Lai to Arondequoit is 17.42 miles. The distance from... Okay. Who knows how far it is from around the court to Chai Lai? Who knows? Raise your hand if you know. How do you know? How do you know? Go ahead. How do you know? If it's one distance from one place traveling in one direction, then it's common sense that it would be the same distance. It's not common sense. There. You would think it would be common sense. You know. How many people said I told you? Who said, I told you? Who thinks I told you? You owe me $20. It's a penalty for lying. I did not tell you. It's not common sense. Obviously, if the distance from point B to point A is 17.42 miles, it's point A to B is 17.4 miles. 
It's not common sense. It's the way you think. You can know things from the way you think. Tell me your name again. Go ahead. Push it down. Push it down. Heather. 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 You know my. You know my mother. You know my brother. Who's older? <laughs> How do you know? I thought you didn't know him. You know him because of the way you think. So it's possible to know things that no one's told you because of the way you think. And when we get to Piaget, you're going to see people think very differently. If my brother stood up next to my mother, three and four-year-olds, 99.999% of them will tell you, oh, your brother's older, because he's taller than she is. There aren't too many people in the world who are not taller than my mother, right? She's, okay, he's taller than she is. Okay. Because of the way you think. But, and, 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 but we'll get to that. Okay. But let's look at information processing. Information processing did one thing. It took, uh, it, it's a theory of memory. You know what you've memorized. The key to knowing is to memorize things and to be able to bring them back out to work with them. It did two things. Number one, it took a whole bunch of stuff that we knew about memory here and there and everywhere and gave them a coherent framework, which was a big contribution. And then it moved on from there to make its own contribution. So let's look at it here. Let's go to the PowerPoint. Here's the whole theory. Okay? Theory is information stores, cognitive processes, and metacognition. Okay, class is over. That's it. All right, ready? Okay. Let's do these one at a time. Information stores. This talks about types of memory sites. Okay, let me go. Let me use this. Okay. Memory stores, if you were. Places where memories are stored. And there are three kinds of memory that it's, this talks about. Sensory memory, working memory, it's usually called working, it used to be called short-term memory, and long-term memory. Okay? See if you can get my picture up in the corner there if possible. Can you work on that? Okay. Let's do these one at a time. Sensory memory is the information store or the memory because, you know, there's places where memories are and then the memories themselves is confusing, that briefly holds environmental stimuli until they can be further processed. Okay? It takes in all the raw data that come from the, from the, from the environment. And, it's st and the stuff stays there, come back to me, for a micro millisecond. Okay? Very good. And it's all kinds of, for instance, I want you to be, co I want you to be conscious now of the feel of your foot on the floor. You didn't feel it before, but now you are. Okay, everyone look at me, whether you're taking it by TV or not, okay? Now, can you see the, here in the room, can you see the lights on the ceiling? Look at me, look at me! Can you see the lights on the ceiling? Sure. Okay, wherever you are at home, you can see something on the ceiling, those of you in the home. You weren't aware of it until I made you aware of it. But all that stuff is coming in, they say. And then, you only take the stuff in that's necessary to, for the problem you're working on. This is a huge problem. Because if, if the stuff comes in, if the stuff comes in to sensory memory first, if the stuff comes into sensory memory first, okay, here it's sensory memory. Right? How, working memory is where you, what you're consciously aware of. Come back to me now. How do you know what's important or what's not important? If suddenly I tell you, look, we're going to have a contest here. You have to be looking at me and tell me how many lights are on the ceiling and four, and you'll get $100,000 if you get it right. But you can't look up. Well, all of a sudden people are going to pay attention to the lights on the ceiling. Okay? Or... Part of, the, part of the midterm is going to be a detailed description of the feel of the chair on your back. The better the description, the more points. All of a sudden, people are going to pay attention. They don't care about this stupid theory, right? So that becomes the question that we have to ask. Of, how do you know what to pay attention to unless the stuff is already in your memory, right? If it's just the raw data, all the raw data would go in, it would seem. Now, we have theories of attention deficit disorder that say kids come in and they can't sort out the memories and all this stuff. Just talk, but... Okay. So, this is problematic. But the sensory memory supposedly takes in all the sensors, and then let's, it goes into the working memory. Okay? 
or the short-term memory. You'll see both used. And this is information store that retains the information with which the person is con consciously working. It contains the information the person's thinking about, i.e., what's on the screen. Come back to me. You can't? Okay. What's on the screen? Okay. Now, this is complex when it comes to information processing. Okay, because a computer really, there are two things that a computer needs to do to work on any given problem. Okay, not just one. If you, let's say you want to write a letter, right? Going to write a letter complaining about tuition is too much. Okay, I see a lot of people, interest perked up. Okay, okay, so you want to write a letter to someone. What, when you have the computer, what do you have to do? You have a specific topic, but what do you have to do first? Yeah. You have to open a word processing program. First, you have to call up the program and put that in the computer's conscious memory, i.e., what is that, RAM, ROM, ring-a-ding, what is that? Who knows? Uh, RAM. RAM. You've got to get that into the computer's RAM. Then you can do the specific problem. So if I say to you, how much is two-thirds plus four-ninths, Let's make it harder. How much is two sevenths plus four ninths? First, say information processing people, you're going to have to call up the program for adding fractions with unlike denominators. And then you can attend to the specific of two third, two sevenths plus four ninths. Yeah, go ahead. 46 60 thirds. Yeah, I don't think that's reducible. Very good. Okay. The only number it could be divided by is 7. Yeah. No. 46 is not divisible by 3. Take my word for it. Does anybody know? I'll show you later. If you know how, how a number is divisible by 3, you, it, right. you add up all the digits, and if the number you add up is divisible by three, the number is divisible by three. Who knew that? Who didn't? Educational malpractice, if you're reducing fractions. So one, six, nine, four. One and six is seven. Nine is 16, and four is 20. Not divisible by three. One, six, nine, five is. Or one, six, nine, four, one is. Because that is up to 21. That, that number is divisible by three. Okay. That's an information processing strategy. Okay. So this is the idea that there are certain program that you have or certain schemes that you have. You have a scheme and that these schemes then they're related to one another. And it turned within these schemes are bits of information. Okay, we'll get to that. Now, Here's the problem with working number, what's in your head, right? So let's, let's go back to the uh, overhead for a second. So the stuff goes from your sensory memory into your work. I know I should have this on a slide, but I tried to draw this once. And after I started shrieking and demanding my therapist, I said, I'll just draw it in there. Okay, Don't I, I'm not too good at PowerPoint. Okay, let's go to the next one. Actually, I know how to do it now, but I'm lazy. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, working memory has some characteristics. It's limited in capacity, right? If I tell you to keep in conscious memory 742 things, you can't do it. Usually, it's seven items of information that you can keep in your head, plus or minus two for adults, between five and nine. For kids, it's less. Come back to me. Why it's less for kids, they, these people can't really explain too well. Developmental theory can. Okay, and here are the character, and, and there's a, here's the other characteristic of working memory. It's limited in duration. Okay. It's limited in duration if you don't make an attempt to do it. Okay, I will tell you, come, come back to me, I'll give you an example. I'm in a hotel up north, and I say, I'm not driving in the stupid snow to get something to eat. Let the, let the pizza driver risk his life, her life, right? What do I care, right? So I call up, and I look, I'm going to order a pizza, right? I was at a convention or something, I don't remember. So, no, I couldn't have been at a convention because I, was, I don't remember. Anyway, I look up Ann's Pizza Shop. Ann's or probably some lady. Right? I got the number. 792463. 792463. 792463. Right? I dial the number. 
the Lower Lands Pizza Shop, click, off, then click off it went, got cut off. Start to dial again, couldn't remember the stupid number. Who cared? I didn't care. I don't want to remember that number ever again. One pizza that I'm back in Houston tomorrow. Okay? That kind of thing. It's very limited in duration. Of course, you can see what's going to happen. It's going to say if there's something you want to remember permanently, you've got to get it into your long-term memory, not your short-term or working memory. Okay? So here's the question. Okay? The period of time you can keep something in your conscious memory is limited. Okay? So we have an attempt to overcome the deficiencies of working or short-term memory. You see, short-term, that's where the word short-term comes from. Okay, one is called chunking. Okay? I'll give you an example of chunking. Don't come, don't come to the overhead. I'm doing it just for me. All right, I'm going to say some numbers and you repeat them after me. Ready? I already told you this when we did IQ. Let's see if you remember. Three, four, nine, Two, six, seven, four, three, eight, four. Go ahead. Very, very, very bad. That's why I didn't have you hold the microphones down. Okay, ready? Let's do it again. Make it into a telephone number. Three, four, nine, two, six, seven, four, three, eight, four. Four three eight four again, three four nine two six seven four three eight four. Now I gave it to you as a phone number. Let's hear it. It's easier. Okay, let's try another one. 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 Ready? Let's go to the thing here, projector. You can't remember twelve letters. Okay, let's go to the uh, tablet. There are those 12 letters. See them? Okay, go off the tablet so they can't see. Let's hear you say them. Right, because what happened, come back, is you chunk them into four meaningful units. Right? Push, push it down, push it down. Oh, he's got a thing. His unit is, never mind. Okay, you've got it four meaningful units, right? Meaningful, this makes a big, cause so you chunk units in order to make them meaningful. Now, instead of 12 units, there are only four. Okay, so that's chunking. Okay, and chunking, let's go over here, helps deal with the problem of limited capacity by combining smaller units into larger, usually meaningful units. So I'm sorry about that red, it shouldn't be. It's usually meaningful, like FBI, CIA, etc. Okay, and we, here's examples of chunking telephone numbers, your social security number, letter strings. Okay, come back to me, I'm going to take a vote. How many people admit that if you have to write your social security number down and they tell you do it continuously without the dashes, you make mistakes? I do. How many people when you write it down go, bup, 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 of course you do. You've got three units. Instead of nine numbers, which is very, you can't remember nine, right? You all write it down that way. How many people are happier when the dashes are in there? Come on. Yeah. A few of us are ready to admit it. Sure. Okay. So that's one thing about keeping. Okay. So now the question of another way, let's go back to the PowerPoint, of overcoming deficiencies of short-term memory is automaticity. Okay. And automaticity means it helps deal with a problem of limited duration by making some operation so automatic that they can be performed with little or no conscious effort. Indeed, they get screwed up if you put in conscious effort. I'm going to show you that now. Come back to me. Who can play the guitar? Anybody? Who can play a guitar? You can play guitar? I can play three chords. Like three different. Yeah, that's like me. Who can play, who can, let's, I might be able to do it. Who can play the piano? Anybody have a know a song by heart on the piano? You can play the piano? I know a song. Okay, come over here. 
Come over here. <clears throat> well, see, we'll do it. But you can't play the piano, right? Right. No, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> do you know the names of the notes you're playing? I can find middle C. No, never mind. <laughs> Two years of piano lessons when I was four. Yeah, come over here. We're going to do it with you. You know a song by heart? Is there a song you know by heart that you can play by heart on the... Wait, 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 wait. Come over here. Is there a song you can play by heart on the guitar? I said we're going to sing this song and you can play it. No. What song? Oh, no, I don't want to sing Are there any? No, you're not going to sing. Are there any songs you know? Yeah, there's one. Which one? Which one? It's got G, C, and D in it. Okay. Okay, ready? What's the name of the song? I don't know the name of it. Oh, that's my favorite song. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here we go. I'm standing up. I'm standing up next to her. Okay, go like this. Then go like this. Put your hands out way in front of you. Like this. No, no, no. Go like this and like this and like this. Okay. No, you're cheating. <laughs> Put them like this. Okay. Now twist them underneath and out. And out. Okay, ready? Play the song. Don't move your fingers. Play the song. I'm not letting her move her fingers. Play the song and tell me what the... Oh! Ho, ho! See that finger moving? Okay, go ahead. Tell me the... Tell me the uh, the chords in the song. In order. Go ahead. Oh, look at her fingers moving. Go ahead. First chord. Look at her fingers moving. What a cheater. Go ahead. First chord. I can, it's G. G, then. Uh, look at this. Look at this. That's why I held her fingers. Then, go ahead. I'm waiting. We could wait here for two months. Okay, now play this. No, no. Now have a guitar. Play the song. It's hard for me. I gotta see it. Go ahead. I can't do it without the guitar. Play air guitar, you know. I don't know how, really. Okay. I know three chords. Okay, but you see, okay. Give her a big hand. Okay, there we go. Yeah, you see, she, it was impossible for her to do it by just remembering. It's automatic. Uh, who's wearing tie shoes? There we go. Ready? Don't look at your feet. Okay, tell me what you have to do to tie a knot, a shoelace knot. Ready? Go ahead. Okay, you, uh, you put... No, 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 don't use your hands. Okay. <laughs> no hands, you're telling me. Okay, you, you, um, you, you fold to each of them up into like bunny ears, then you, you tell them around each other and... Uh, 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 look at his hands, look at his hands. <laughs> Is that how you do it? Oh, that's the bunny ear one. Okay, go ahead, then what? And then you, you put the one, one of the bunny ears into the other uh, hole. No, that's not right. That's not right. You don't put it into the other. You cross it over the other. Okay. Okay. Am I right? Uh, you were wrong. Uh, yeah. Then what? And then you, um, then you pull the ears out and then it, it's okay. Wrong, 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 wrong. You forgot, you forgot two steps. <laughs> okay. Now, unless, unless he started to tie his shoe six o'clock this morning to make the, get to this course on time, right? He, he, he can obviously tie his shoes much faster than he can tell us. I'll show you another one. This one applies to all of you. I am now going to demonstrate for you what happened the first time you were in a car. I'm going to sit over here. You're in a car. The first time you came to a stop sign or a red light, and the person that just said, stop, stop, you go, you're there. <laughs> right? Okay, if you know, don't, don't say, I mean, if, if somebody's told you, what do you do so that you don't come to that jerking stop at a stop sign? If you, who knows? Raise your hand if you know what you do. Four people. Wait, wait, wait a second. No, in other words, when you're driving, what do you, what do you do to keep from stopping the way you did at the beginning like this? Who knows? Who knows? Tell me what you do. Well, you have your, uh, you push your foot gently on the brake, and then you let off the brake. Who knew that? Who, know, who didn't know that? How did you know that? Huh? Oh, you did it! What a cheat! Right, most people don't know that. How many people knew that when you stop, at the last second you lift your foot up and you put it down again? It's, that it's, doesn't apply to ABS brake systems. No? They don't, 
they don't jerk. Most people break that way anyway. Okay? At least if you're all as old as I am, you do. Okay? I mean, it's you, it's, there are things you do that you don't even think about. It's automatic. If I ask someone the simplest thing you, it's just automatic. Now, it's a complex behavior. I still remember in kindergarten, I'm still traumatized by it. I couldn't tie my shoes. Isn't that amazing? It's 55 years ago. And I remember I couldn't tie my shoes. And the, and the teacher says to the girl, Anne, and she was a redhead. Isn't that, I remember her name was Anne, and she was a redhead. She said, tie a shoe for him, will you? Oh, man, was that embarrassing. <laughs> Takes forever to turn this one, this one. By the way, that bunny, I don't tie shoes at a bunny. Here. Most of us tie it by going through, right? And this and that. Yeah, you're, you're, it was cheating. You got a simple one. Yeah, and you still got yeah, it wrong. I, I remember now. I just, I, just, I just went blank for a second there. You know, you're used to doing it, but then you, I went blank when you asked me. That's like, right. Yeah. But, but yeah, of course you went blank. Of course you went blank. Because it's automatic. You never think about how to tie your shoes. You just do it. You've pushed it out of your conscious memory, the idea that you have to think. I knew you'd get it wrong, right? Everybody does. You have to get it wrong because it's automatic. And of course, the idea that things become automatic, that's the kind of thing that we, right, that we want to do. Breaking a car, playing a tune, right? As a matter of fact, some of that is amazing. They once pictured Yasha Heifetz, that he agreed to let them take a picture of him the cold question of automaticity is a fascinating one from a neurologist's point of view. Even before this theory of him playing the violin, and they recorded the speed. You know, Yashafis was one of the world's greatest violinists, uh, one of the world's greatest violinists, maybe the greatest in his day. I think it was in the 50s. I think he died in the 60s, but he was maybe the 70s. He was considered world, the world's greatest violinist. His fingers moved faster. This is when they had first measured they, they had to measure how fast impulses get to your brain. His fingers move faster than impulses could get to the brain. But we have that too. When you touch a stove, you pull away and then it hurts. It's interesting. Before the pain impulse gets to your, it gets to your brain, you're pulling away. It's interesting. It's not so, but it's, I mean, that's innate. Some hot you pull away, but it's, it's this automaticity the idea of automaticity, of course, makes, again, it overcomes the deficiencies or inefficiencies of working memory. Okay? The problem with automaticity is that once you can get things that are automatic and wrong. Okay? One of my professors um, went to England. He got his doctorate in England. And he was told, remember, left side of the road, left side of the road, turn left. Da, 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 da. One day he comes around a curve, right? And he sees a car coming straight at him. Without thinking, whoa, he goes like this. Because the other guy goes like this. Bang, and they had a head-on crash. He had a scar. He told us about this scar, right? It was just automatic to go like this. Well, it's not very good. Eh? Anybody ever drive in England? Oh, my God, what a mess. <laughs> Anybody been to England in general? Oh, a lot of people have been to England. How many people... You're crossing the street and you're looking this way for the cars and they're coming this way, right? <laughs> Man, people have been hurt. Yep, everybody. I was, I had the opposite problem. I got so nervous, I used to bang into the left side of the curb because I was in the wrong side. The guy comes to me and says, you've curbed the tire. You'll have to pay an extra 15 pounds, whatever it was. I'm thinking, mister, I busted that axle. I paid the money and I got out of there as fast as I could, right? And the tire was a little... Right. I went the wrong way around a traffic circle. Scared the bejeebers out of me. I was like, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Thank God the circle was around a grass thing. I just looked and I just got in the thing and went onto the grass, right? <laughs> looked around to see what's going on. Uh, I'm still here, so I guess it was the right maneuver. I mean, it was a busy one, too. So it's automatic. What happens with kids is if you give them things before they're developmentally ready, they will develop strategies for handling them, right? If I were suddenly to tell you, tie your shoes a different way, right? Who uses the bunny ear strategies to tie shoes? You make the two loops and you knot the loops around each other. Yeah, a couple of people. And how many people use the cross, the one inside the other? Most of the other people. If I were to tell you to change, it would be tough. You wouldn't think about it. Right? You know the bunny ear, when he's saying the bunny ears, and they'll make the two loops and you tie them, right? That's actually a little faster, but they're not supposedly doesn't stay as well. I don't know. His shoes are tied, so I guess it works okay, right? 
So you have to be, you have to be, and it's very difficult to change. And once kids develop strategies, and kids will develop strategies for handling situations where they have no idea. I'll give you an example. I'm working with a high school student. And we're reading these, these I, I met these, the Barnell Loft series. They have different theories for different skills. And one was understanding. So it was like, there's a little story about how jaguars hunt fish. They hang on a branch over the, tr over the river, and they drop saliva into the river. The fish thinks it's above, they come up, and whoop, the jaguar gets the fish. Okay? So it says, so this is concluding. What could you conclude from this? And the right answer was the jaguars can climb trees. Oh, they can get on the branch otherwise, right? And this was at his, and the answer was B. So he says, B. I said, how do you know? He said, ah, not B, I meant A. I said, how do you know? He said, nah, I was just kidding, it's C. I said, how do you know? He said, all right, I'll tell you the real answer, it's D. I said, how do you know? He looked at me like I was nuts. He had a strategy. Give an answer. If it's right, the teacher goes on. If it's wrong, the teacher asks you, how do you know? You've got to change your answer right away. Right? It's a, and he could fool people. He really... There was some stuff he couldn't do at all. He could read pretty well, and they come in, but he had some stuff he couldn't do at all. And he had people fooled. So he had developed a strategy because he was given stuff before he was developmentally ready. Of course, something this theory doesn't tell us about. And now he's stuck with that strategy. He's, he's married to that strategy. Okay, and just for completely, let's go to the, let's go to the uh, PowerPoint. This automaticity applies to both declarative and procedural knowledge. If I talk about the knowledge first, then the automaticity doesn't come in. Okay, but just let me give you a little example about procedural knowledge. Uh, uh, okay, come back to me. A procedure is how to do something. We'll get to that in more detail. How many people here basically drive home in a fog? You're driving home. You say, how did I get here? Right? You, uh, you've done it, right? If you had to remember every day how to drive home, there'd be no point in going home. You might as well stay where you are because it would take you hours to get there and back, right? Okay, it just becomes automatic. You're not even aware of why. How many people, they, all of a sudden they've changed something on your way home. You're not even aware, and, and all of a sudden, something's gone. When I would drive home, right? Something's gone and you get lost, so you do it. They took the sign away from my street. I drove right past. Now, I wasn't aware that that sign was, it was automatic, that that sign was what I was using, but I was. I moved, thank God, now there's another sign at the corner of the street. If they talk off that children's crossing sign from the corner of my street, I swear I'd pass it by. And, of course, another thing happens. In my old house, it was automatic. You make, a, you make the turn, you go to the first stop sign, and you turn onto the street. In my new house, I've done it 50 times. I make the turn, go to the first stop sign, and turn onto the street. Unfortunately, it's the street after the stop sign where I live. And I drove right up to the same address. And unfortunately, one of my son's best friends, her parents live there, but she's home. Every time she's home, she asks me, oh, you're coming to visit again, huh? She caught me again a few weeks ago. I said, well, at least I didn't drive into your driveway this time, right? It's just, it's so automatic to go to the stop sign and turn that I have to consciously remember, no, don't go, because it's automatic, and now it's no good. So you have to be very careful about that. Okay, now we're going to talk about long-term memory, okay? Ultimately, let's go back to the, to the overhead here, to the, power, uh, to the tablet, I mean. Yeah, the overhead, that's right. Eventually, information goes from short-term memory into long-term memory, or working memory, into long-term memory. And it's pulled, and this is where it's stored so that it can be permanent. And also, you notice this arrow goes both ways, and then and you pull it back when you need it, right? So that if I'm adding fractions, how come you can't see the pen here? If I'm adding fractions, so I'm going to take the stuff about fractions and move it, maybe I can do it with this, yeah, and move it back here, right, into my working memory. I store it here, and I call it back when I need it. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. The characteristics of long-term memory are... Unlike, oh good, thanks. Unlike working memory, it's permanent store for information. In other words, what people will tell you, come back to me for a second, what people will tell you is, look, you never really forget anything. It's just you can't get to it. How many people have stuff on your computer you don't know where it is? Yeah, I don't know where it is, right? The other day, the undergrads was almost in a delirium of delight. I had their midterm and I lost it. I didn't know where the heck it was. I couldn't remember what I called it, so I do a search. I couldn't remember what I called it. 
Finally, one of the doctoral students says to me, maybe it's stored under last year's stuff instead of this year's stuff. Oh, there it was. Oh, good. Right? Good for me, bad for the undergrads, right? So, and they're going to tell you, many of these people are going to tell you, you never forget anything. You just can't get to it, i.e., you have a retrieval problem. That's exactly how computers do it. They retrieve information from their hard disk. Your brain is a hard disk. A hard drive, a hard drive, right, is a hard drive. And you're retrieving it from the hard drive. Yeah, go ahead. What happens if you're someone who has a photographic memory? Well, that's it. How do you do that? The, the, question of, the question of, we're going to get to that, how do you get stuff in and get it back out is a big question for them. And that's the kind of person who can get everything out. But not everybody agrees to that. A, a physiological psychologist, so I come back, go back to the PowerPoint if you can. That's why there's a big question mark here. Physiological psychologists will tell you baloney, that you're setting up neurological circuits, and these neurological circuits can decay from lack of use. Is there anybody here who knew a language when you were a kid and don't know it anymore? I'm one of those. Let's try. What language did you know? Push it down, push it down. Spanish. Spanish. Somebody talks to you in Spanish, can you understand? Parts of it. That means not really, right? Parts of it, a little bit. But she's saying she knows Spanish better than someone who's never heard it. Who else had a language? You had one? What one did you know? It was the same. It's Spanish. Spanish. Anybody else? What do you know? Italian. Push it down, push it down. Italian. And if somebody says something in Italian, can you understand it? Push it, push it down. Not as good as I used to. I used to know it almost fluently, but now it's... Yeah, you forget it. How's your Spanish? I can understand it okay, but not so much in Texas. It's okay, East Coast. Well, is there anyone who has a language at all? No? I have one that I hardly know at all. My, you can come back to me. Okay, thanks. My, my, uh, my grandmother, for the first two or three years of my life, my parents lived with my mother's mother. And she spoke Yiddish. That's, that's the language of the Jews of Eastern Europe. And she really didn't know English at all. I can tell you that right now. She really didn't know that. And I stopped talking when she went, she went to live in Israel with her, where most, where the rest of the family. And when I saw her years later, we, it was very hard for us to communicate. I mean, she brought me up, helping me up the first Because her English, if she knew any, she'd forgotten it. My, my, my father told me she, she hardly knew any English. And, and, but I could speak to her. Now, the question is, could you hypnotize me? Is it there somewhere? Could you go back? I understand a few words and phrases. And I could call you a couple of dirty names. But aside from that, actually, there aren't too many curse words in Yiddish. You say bad things about a person. Like, may your head be stuck in the ground and your feet be up like, a, like an onion, right? Be stuck in, may you be like an onion with your head in the ground and your feet up in the air. Yeah. Curse people like that, okay? So, or stuff like that. But, but I can do a few things like that. And I know a few phrases. Some of it I've learned later, but I don't really know it too well. And most people tell you, forget it. You haven't spoken Yiddish since you were three. Forget it. It's gone. It's deteriorated. The laps are there. Although most people will tell you that if we start going into Spanish classes, you don't know Spanish too well at all now, right? You'll be able to learn it a lot faster than other people. And of course, it has meaning units. Most of you know that you would be able to learn, most of us would be able to learn Spanish a lot faster than Chinese. Because Spanish has a lot of similarities to English that Chinese doesn't. And it's the building on it, okay? Anybody, know, anybody speak Arabic? A little bit, yeah. Okay, but that's not your native language. A little bit from science. Go ahead, what? You it's study Arabic, is, right? We read Quran. Yeah, I'm telling you, if everybody in this class, if he started to teach us Arabic, I'd be the best student. Because Arabic is related to Hebrew. I know some of the rules across the relationships, but a lot of the words are the same, and I know some of them. It's me much easier, because I can make sense out of it. It's going into something that I have a meaning structure for. Semitic language. I understand that it's built on, on constructions rather than on tenses. It's built on roots, and you do things with the roots, and that's a, I understand that. So again, you can learn things when they're meaningful, or when you've had past experience, but it's, it's pretty much, it, it, if you don't use it, it's gone. 
Okay, the next thing, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Theoretically, long-term memory has unlimited capacity. You're not allowed to say to the teacher, well, I've been learning for 15 years, I'm full up. I'm 47 years old, that's it, can't learn anymore. It doesn't work that, work that way. Again, there's a question about that. The reason, is there, can you really learn everything? Did somebody talk about photographic memory? Uh, some people are able to remember certain things, and it looks like, but they, nobody can remember everything that's ever happened to her or him. Um, there's another thing about this is where the idea comes from. We only use 10% of our brain. You've all heard that one, right? Oh, give me a break. Once I had somebody giving a lecture, like, we only use 10% of what's up there. So I raised my hand. I said, you know, I have a relative who has Parkinson's and needs a brain transplant, needs brain tissue. Can you give me about 20% of your brain to do that? I said, you have 80 left? You still have 70% you have nothing to do with, right? It's ridiculous. Obviously, we use all our brain. Our brain is interactive across the hemispheres and everything. Our brain is constant. Our brain is circuitry. But what they're really trying to say is we can remember a lot of stuff. And if we just get it right about how to remember it and how to recall it or how to encode it and retrieve it, these days, kids don't remember anything anymore. They encode it, like they're little computers. Oh, no, they retrieve it. They don't learn anything anymore. They encode it. They don't remember anything. They retrieve it. Okay? So let's go back. Long-term memory is the place where information is remembered from short, from working memory to long-term memory, and where it's recalled from long-term memory back into working memory when you need it. So if I say to all of you, okay, uh, elephant, now none of you, not, I don't think too many of you were thinking about an elephant. But when I said it, you were able to take the concept of an elephant and put it into your, into your working memory. Okay? Now, more about long-term memory. In order for information to be remembered, it has to be removed, has to be moved from short-term memory to long-term memory, encoded, just the way computers do. Okay? And we have ways, okay, and in order to work with previously learned information has to be recalled from long-term memory, worked into work, moved into work memory, retrieval. That's how computers work. Go in, get the program, bring it up. Okay? And information processing people tell you, was, well, you know, we have senses, sensory memory that do that for us. Sensory memory, eyes, ears. That's what they mostly were going well, computers have. How do computers take in information and get it into working? How do they take in information? They have senses too. Go ahead. Through the keyboard. Keyboard. Through a camera. Camera. Various USB devices or FireWire devices. USB devices. Parallel, whatever you want. Right. Disks, all that stuff. That's it, take it in there, and then they store it in there, and then when you get it in there from the environment, comes into the working memory, and then you can, all the computers you can go around. You can take a computer and put a disk right into the hardware, right? right? And then you retrieve it when you need it. Okay. Now comes the question of, let's start on this before the break. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. The types of knowledge in long-term memory. That's just types of knowledge in long-term memory. Okay. There's declarative knowledge. Knowledge of facts, definitions, rules, and generalizations. And there's procedural knowledge. Knowledge of how to perform activities, how to do things, etc. Okay, now. Declarative knowledge. Don't look at that. There are four kinds of declarative knowledge. Propositional networks, linear orderings, images, and schemas. This is the key. We'll get there. All right, so let's take a look at them. Propositional networks. That says, remembering, it's remembering the relationship among objects. Domestic cats are feline. They are the smallest felines. Balls roll. Baseballs are covered with leather, etc. Speaking of which, go Astros! Okay, baseballs are covered with leather. I admit I got discouraged in the middle of the 2004 season. Okay, that's the kind of things you know. And, and interestingly enough, it gives you some knowledge. So if you say, okay, come back to me if you can. Okay, if you say, um, uh, I don't know, balls roll. And I have a ball in my house, you know that it rolls. 
If I tell you, okay, so it's the start of having a generalization of knowledge, okay? Now, linear, linear orderings. Those are knowing orders of the days of the week, knowing the order of the months, classifying objects in a hierarchy, okay? All beagles are dogs, all dogs are canines, all canines are mammals, all mammals are vertebrates, etc., etc. But I'm going to tell you, this is not learned knowledge. And if you're in elementary school, this, is, this learned knowledge requires a cognitive background. This is things pre-operational kids cannot do. This is the big deficit of this theory that it doesn't take development into account. I'll give you an example. Take a kid. Show the kid, these are 10 ducks and two robins. Say to the kid, what are these ducks, these robins? Actually, kid said to me, duckies, robins. I said, are the duckies birds? All the duckies are birds. And the robins, oh, the robins are birds too. Two robins. I said, are there more birds or more ducks? More ducks. Wait a minute. The ducks are birds and the robins are birds, right? Right. Birds, birds. More ducks or more birds? More ducks. All the ducks and the robins are birds too. You have more. The robins make extra birds, right? Yep. So are there more ducks or more birds? More ducks. How do you know? So look at all the ducks. Just two robins. Okay, now that's really for Piaget, but the I, uh, hierarchical reasoning is what pre-operational kids cannot do and what concrete operational kids can do. But there's an ordering, and you know it. And once you have the cognitive ability, you can do that. Okay? So that's one kind that's the second kind of things we have, orderings. Finally, we have images, mental pictures, okay? A mental image of a map. A mental image of an event occurred in a person's past. We not, tend not to oper uh, do this too much, but you have vivid memories of things, right? Okay? So you can remember things, or you can remember instructions. How many people here, if you have to get from point A to point B, let's take a vote here, want a map? And how many people want written instructions? You get one or the other. Who would take the map? Not me. Who would take the written instructions? About 50-50. It's interesting. Okay. Some people like both. Yeah, I, I, if I said both, you'd want both. But I'm getting you one or the other. See, that's preference for one or the other. And finally, we have schemas. These are things you're remembering. You're making order to them. It's a knowledge that represents an understanding of events, objects, and actions, or to put it another way, it's a combination of propositions, images, and linear orderings. Okay? It's all the stuff you learn, and you put it together into some knowledgeable concept. Okay? Come back to me. I'll give you an example. Okay? In my house, I have a flingamadorp. It's an animal. And the flingamadorp, the only thing I'll tell you about the flingamadorp, is that it's a mammal. Now you can call up your schema for mammal. Sometimes it's schema, sometimes it's proschematas. You can call up your schema for mammal and tell me a lot about the flingamadorp. What can you tell me about the flingamadorp? It's a mammal. What can you tell me? It bears live young. It bears live young. 90%. Some mammals don't. Like platypuses don't. There are a couple others that don't. What else can you tell me about the flingamadorp? What? Push it down. Say it. It's warm-blooded. It's warm-blooded. What else? Who said something about hair? Say it again. Push it down. It has hair. It has hair or fur. <laughs> or fur. Or fur. Even dolphins and whales do. What else? The bear youngs. What? The bear youngs. It, it bears live young. We said that except with a few exceptions. Mammal, mammal. Where does the word come from? What does the word, what does a mammal mean? Mammary. Mammary glands. It nurses, it suckles, it's young, right? So that you know. Can you tell me how big it is? No, you have mammals this big and you have mammals that are enormous, right? Like mice. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I don't like rodents, I hate to tell you that. Even squirrels, I don't like. Rodents are not for me. Okay. They're better than rats, but that's not saying much. So... You get a schema. If I, say, if I give you a schema about a 
country, a scheme about something, a scheme about X, a scheme about Y. Okay? And this gives you knowledge, and then when you take in knowledge, you can take it in. So a flingamadork, oh, it's a mammal. I know something about it. I can memorize stuff about the flingamadork in the context of what I know. If somebody's going to teach me Arabic, I can start learning in the context of what I know about Semitic languages. You guys know nothing. Okay? Most of you know nothing, with one exception, apparently. So I know, and there's was there one other people knows know, knows Hebrew. Is that it? Okay, he and I would be the best two students in the Arabic for a while. Okay, because of stuff we know, words that are the same, etc. So the idea is that when you learn, you put things into schemas, and the schemas themselves interact and interrelate. And after we come back, we'll talk about how to get stuff in and out of the schemas. Okay. <laughs>